decentralized energy. So I say the name suggests that we are building something decentralized. That is also related to what I'm going to talk today. So the mission of the Finity Foundation is to deliver a new internet. So the internet setup, the protocol was invented like 50 years ago, and now it's quite out of date. And you know, on this old internet system, we have many uh, tech giants like Facebook, Twitter, Google. And um, as a user, you use this, uh, the products produced by these um, companies, uh, you contribute to their ecosystem. For instance, Twitter, you, um, you write something, right? So you, um, you contribute to their ecosystem and also you uh, use YouTube, you upload videos. So you are contributing. And sometimes you might have to watch some of their advertisements. And that's how these tech giants earn money. So uh, they get money from advertisers. And as a user, you contribute to their ecosystem and you spend your time watching their advertisements and you earn nothing. So money is earned by the uh, tech giants. And what is even worse is as a user, you contribute the content and also your own privacy, your own personal data. So it's these companies like Google, they decide how to use your data. And we had quite some scandals like two years ago, there was this uh, Cambridge Analytica. So they try to influence the, uh, the, the voting uh, results. Um, this is getting worse and worse. So the mission of the Finity Foundation is to build a new internet that is decentralized, that is not owned by any single entity or any single government. And so this new internet is going to be supported by millions of, uh, of uh, data centers distributed all over the world. And if some government is not happy with it and want to shut it down, this whole system will be still resilient. We are still functioning because, uh, because we, we are decentralized. That's the beauty of the, of the decentralization. And so this course is to uh, give you some uh, knowledge about decentralized finance. And hopefully at the end, you uh, get interest in this decentralized finance and also start your own business. And um, the Defending Foundation is going to launch the test net, uh, by end of this month and the uh, mandate by this year. So meaning starting from, from end of this year, you will be able to build your own software. Like you can build the open version of Google, open version of LinkedIn, or open version of Facebook. It might sound like a lot of work, but I can tell you to build a LinkedIn, you just need two developers using like two, two and a half days to build, because we did that. We replicate LinkedIn on our test net. We use only developers for less than three days. And we build the LinkedIn and we call it LinkedIn up. And this kind of software deployed on this new internet uh, are not covered by any single group of entity. It's owned by all the users. So as a user, you use this kind of uh, autonomous decentralized applications. Uh, you contribute into this ecosystem and then you earn money out of it. So that's the beauty of the decentralization. All right, so um, today I will talk about um, blockchain, crypto economics, and how does blockchain empower uh, decentralized finance. All right, um, I hope by the end of this talk, I could convince you, um, first of, of all, um, money is uh, a story. Money is a story we tell each other Money is a story we firmly be believe in. Um, and money is a story that is recognized by the whole society. That is a consensus. So if someone asks you what is money, you might point at the, the banknotes in your, in your wallet or uh, some digital number in your bank account. But these are just physical representations of money. It's not money itself. No? Money in essence is a story we believe. So it can be something physical or something virtual, right? It's just like knowledge. Ask, people ask you, what is knowledge? You point at the book and say, that's knowledge. No, that's not, that's the physical representation of knowledge. Knowledge is something in our brain. It's a story we tell each other, right? And um, like um, one plus one equals two. And I guess most people agree on that, right? So one plus one equals two, that's knowledge. And we all share this knowledge. We all believe in this knowledge that it becomes uh, a public common uh, stuff we all believe in. And money is the same. 
we point at the gold, we say this is money, and everyone behind that, now we can use gold as money. If someday we can put it, um, some stone and say this is money, and everyone believes in that, that is also money. So money, in essence, is a consensus, is a memory, is a story. Okay, and second story I want to um, tell you is blockchain. So you might have heard of blockchain many times, might be confused what is blockchain because it's a totally new word. So um, in essence, blockchain is a ledger. So ledger is like a kind of book, right? So it records all transactions. Like some commercial banks or central banks, they hold a ledger. So if you transfer some money to your friend, let's say uh, you all have accounts in a you know, bank, Bank of America, and you transfer some money from your account to your friend's account, then this Bank of, of America records this transaction. So deduct some money from your account, add some money to your friend's account. So that is a ledger, that is accounting book. But this accounting book is centralized, it's owned by the Bank of America. So that might, to some extent, you don't know, right? Because lack of transparency, they might add um, millions of dollars in their own account, or they might deduct some money from your account without telling you. And that won't happen nowadays because there's bank supervision, I will talk about that later. So this is the centralized ledger we have nowadays. Blockchain is nothing but a ledger. It differs from the centralized ledger in the sense that it is distributed. It is not owned by one single entity or one group of people. It is owned by every user. If you want to own the ledger, you can be the ledger owner. And with blockchain, um, you could have you could create decentralized money. Um, I will talk about that uh, in the second part of this uh, of this talk. Um, the third story is a smart contract. So blockchain is uh, not just a ledger. On top of the blockchain, you can also build smart contracts. I will tell you the difference between the smart contracts and the stupid contract we have nowadays. And with smart contract, um, you could build decentralized finance applications or some other applications like LinkedIn, Google, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, uh, Netflix, on the new internet. So it doesn't have to be, to be like decentralized, de decentralized finance or DeFi or affiliation. It doesn't have to be a DeFi product. But since today, we, um, we are talking about, we, we are um, mostly, of, most of students are from the business school, so let's focus on the business side of the, of the smart contract. All right, so before we dive Thank in. Thank you, Yui. I, I just want to catch one student question. Since a lot of them sure. said they know what money is. So um, who, who want to answer the question? What do you think money is? In the survey, a lot of you says you know about it. Probably it's like a in your body. How about a char charak adding? Or uh, yes, yes, it's true. So basically, I didn't give that definition. I give just a normal, a normal definition as money is a value that we pay and is an exchange for product or for a living. That's the definition that I give, basically. Cool. Thank Hello? you. Uh, okay. How about emailing? Are you here? Or Ji Anxi? Uh, yes, madam. Uh, I think money is the medium, uh, media of the exchange. Uh, people use money to exchange what they need and what they produce. Okay, so now uh, Yulin will start to talk about what money is in his story. Let's Great. see if it will change our <laughs> Cool. Yeah, so um, I think both of them um, touch the point. So money is, um, so you talk, you talk about what money is used for, right? It's like, what can you do with knowledge? You can use knowledge to do research, to do business, but that's not knowledge itself, right? You can be like a politician, you can be a cop, that is only your profession, that is what you can do, but that's not who you are, right? So money has three functions. Uh, the first is uh, as a medium of exchange, so you can use money for payment. The second is money is the stock value. 
right? So you earn some money you don't want to spend at home, and you can save the money and then spend later. That's a stock value. And the third function is uh, as a unit of account. So it's a yardstick to measure the price of other goods, right? Um, this, this is, are the three basic functions of money, and, but money itself is more than that. Okay, so before, uh, before diving uh, the start of the first section, what money is, I want to uh, talk at a very high level, um, uh, three messages I want to deliver today is, the first is uh, research in the private sector is uh, quite different from uh, research in academia. So in academia, um, research is driven out of curiosity. I want to do this research, I want to find out why one plus one equals two, because I'm curious. This might serve nothing, but I just want to find out why. I just want to prove something. But in, in the industry, in the private sector, it's kind of different. Different. We have some problem, we want to solve that problem, so we need to come out with new solutions, new ideas, new technology. And secondly, this new technology, new idea, um, prospers if they meet the demand of people. Right? So you might have some fancy idea, uh, great technology, but it's uh, nothing, then uh, it will die soon. And there are numerous examples of this kind of uh, new technology. And um, third, um, so as some of you might present um, your projects later on, I want you to pay attention that the new technology um, solves the old problem, but it brings the new challenges. So when you present your project, um, I want you to think as a chief economist, as if you were designing a product. And so I want you to pitch clearly what kind of problem we had before and how does this new DeFi product solves the old problem. So what is the new technology it comes up? Will it prosper? And does this new technology meet people's demand? This is the question I expect you to answer. And most importantly, also pay attention to uh, what kind of new it brings uh, to this world. And can you um, come up with a solution for the new challenge? So, I want to encourage you to really think out of the box, no matter how crazy it is. You know, if, if an idea doesn't sound crazy at the first place, then maybe it's not innovative enough, right? So like a flying car might sound crazy. If you go back like 150 years ago, we tell people that we could have plan, we, have, we could have like a, a, a car, automobiles, um, might sound crazy to them, but now they're all happening nowadays, right? So really think out of the box, think what would happen in 10, 20 years, and uh, don't let the, the current constraints um, limit your imagination. All right, so let's start with the first topic, what is money? Um, as I said before, money is not only the banknotes, it's not only the physical representation. So why do we have money? And that comes to uh, economics, what do we do with economics? So economics is given the uh, input uh, because we have limited resource, we have scarce resource. So given the input, how do we design a mechanism or a system that maximizes the output? So that's econo what economics is about by and large. And you know, to increase the, uh, the efficiency, uh, for efficiency, um, we had the division of labor a uh, long time ago. You might be good at hunting, I'm good at fishing, so why don't you just go hand, hunting and I go fishing? And then that involves trading, right? So I, I, fi I got some fish and you, you got some rabbits and we want to exchange. Uh, so at the very beginning, we had the butter economy, so we just exchange. We agree that I use two fish to exchange for one rabbit. Um, but this kind of body economy won't last long because it violates the double coincidence of wants um, in, in many senses. For instance, time-wise, I have today, I want to exchange for one rabbit, but you don't have rabbit, and then it doesn't work, right? And second, my, I have like fish, I want to exchange for rabbit, but the, the hunter might live 1,000 miles away from uh, where I live. 
So in that case, it also doesn't work. By the time I, uh, I meet you, maybe the fish already go back. And also scale-wise, I have 1,000 fish I want to exchange for 500 rabbits, and you have only one rabbit. So that's the problem with uh, the market economy. And money eventually emerged. So at the very beginning, um, millions of years ago, we lived only with our family. There were no city, no uh, whatever organization. We live in a family. And I go hand, maybe my brother go uh, fishing and then we have something we don't need to exchange. We are family, we share everything. But eventually, you know, the, uh, we like several families form together, form uh, a tribe. And the tribe grows larger and larger. We might uh, need to exchange goods with our families. And then when we exchange, we need sort of money because, again, as I said, the body economy doesn't work. So when the tribe is small and we have trust in each other, we have good memory, then we don't really need the real money uh, or the uh, physical representation money. We just say, I give you two rabbits and you owe me four fish. You, you need to give me back tomorrow. And so when I give this uh, rent to you, and this is a sort of transaction, and this is recorded in my brain and also in your brain. But to prevent, to in case you might renege tomorrow, say you don't owe me any fish, so we need to broadcast this transaction to everyone in this tribe. As you renege, everyone will condemn you. So we broadcast this transaction to other family members, to other families via the gossip network. So everyone is on the same page. We all agree that you owe me some fish. And this is consensus. If everyone agree on that, this is a consensus. This is already believe that you owe me money. But the problem of, of this virtual brand money is that it doesn't scale because we have the memory. Right? When the when the tribe grows larger and larger, become a village, become a town, become a city, millions of people. Billions of transactions every day, no one can memorize that, right? So now what happened, uh, what emerged is the commodity money, which is a physical representation uh, of money that really human brand from accounting. So uh, the typical examples of commodity money is gold and still exists nowadays like in, in prisons, like cigarettes, uh, that role as, as a money. And I heard like in some American jails, instant noodles, uh, <laughs> is used as money. So this, this is physical commodity money that is, um, that is tangible, you can, you can feel, you can touch. So today I give you two rabbits and you give me one ounce of gold. And tomorrow I can just use this one ounce of gold to exchange for maybe some fish from you or some apples from someone else. And this kind of commodity money is recognized by the whole society and that's again consensus. So I hope you are convinced that money is nothing but a consensus and it can have many different types of many forms. All right, so the commodity money solves the problem of the brand money in the sense that it relieves human brain from accounting, um, but also brings new challenges. What is a new challenge? The first is the issuance rate is unstable. We don't know, we can predict how, many, how much gold can be mined in the next few decades, right? So if the supply of gold is unstable, then the price will be volatile, right? So this year we produce 100 apples and we have 10 ounces of gold. And the next year we produce 1,000 gold, or 1,000 apples and we have, we have only 200 ounces of gold. Then we have deflation and so on and so forth. There, the, if you cannot account for the money supply, then the price of the money will be very volatile. So as I said before, money has three functions. Um, one of the three major functions, uh, a unit of account. It's a yardstick. If the yardstick changes all the time, that is not a good uh, uh, form of money. Okay, so that's the first challenge. The second challenge is authentication. How do you check real gold or, or, or fake gold, right? Whether it's counterfeit money. And the third problem is hard to divide and having to carry it can get oxidized easily, it's hard to store, and so on and so forth. There are also some other problems with commodity money. 
So what happened after that is the uh, fiat money. And after the invention of a paper, uh, we find, okay, why don't we just print money and, and uh, agree on that then this paper, this banking note, is, is money. And the banking notes have to be printed only by the central banks. And because central banks has better uh, reputation and uh, credibility than private institutions. So nowadays, most, uh, most countries have, uh, have, a, have a, a central bank, a central bank prints uh, fiat money, and the government need four. So everyone has to use uh, the fiat money because there are two things we cannot avoid. The first is debt. The second is tax. You live in a country, you need to pay tax. Uh, directly or indirectly. And the tax needs to be paid in the legal tender, um, which could be a bank note or some digital number in, in, the, in your bank account. So the advantage of the federal money is that uh, since it is printed by the central bank, so the central bank could easily contract the money supply or increase the money supply. So the money supply can be easily managed and then solve this problem, this unstable issuance rate. So we can have relatively stable uh, price of, of, the, of the fiat money. And this, another advantage is it could stimulate the economy. Uh, like after the financial crisis of 2008, um, people tend to hold money. Um, so you, you hold money, you don't spend, and then goods, uh, the factories and companies that cannot sell their goods, then they fail. So that's what happened in the financial crisis and also now in COVID-19. So what central bank can do, they can print money. You don't buy, right? you don't buy commodities, you don't buy assets. Central banks um, act as the last resort um, and the central banks buy all the assets. Central banks buy all the, all the goods and that drives up the price of the goods and assets and then the factories Companies, uh, they have money to survive. They could pay their employee salary, and the employee get more salary. They could uh, spend. So that's how to stimulate the economy by printing money. And fiat money is, of course, also easy to carry to store. And fiat money brings, of course, uh, problems as well. So first, it has no intrinsic value. Like this, uh, one hundred dollar, the Intrinsic value maybe is only like two cents to print this, this uh, $100. The first value is 100. Um, it is created out of thin air. It has no intrinsic value or little intrinsic value. So the central banks and governments are tempted to print more money because printing money is so cheap. I could just print money to finance uh, my own debt, my government's debt. And so you, you might have seen this word quantitative easing uh, many times. So in Lehman's word, quantitative easing means money. And then dump money or pump the money into the economy. That's quantitative easing. And if you print a lot of money, uh, money becomes less valuable. Money loses purchasing power. That is inflation. You know, in the history, we have seen a lot of hyperinflation. Inflation rate could be more than 100%, uh, meaning you could, uh, you could buy you could use $100 to buy maybe um, one basket of apples. The next year, you could only buy a basket of apples if the inflation rate is, is 100%. So that is the problem of fiat money. It has no intrinsic value. It is backed by nothing but the, but the government's reputation. And nowadays, the government's reputation of credibility is, is quite fragile. You see a lot of government uh, have um, um, a default like uh, the Greek government, uh, Cyprus, and also many uh, other small countries. The second problem is probably inflation. The US dollar and also other sovereign currencies have lost purchasing power over the last 100 years. Like the US dollar has lost more than 80% of the purchasing power over the last 70 years. So if you had $100 70 years ago and you didn't spend the money, and then 70 years later, you can buy only like 50% of, of the goods what you can bought like uh, 70 years ago. Okay. So this is a fiat money. It definitely solves the problems of the commodity money because the supply can be easily managed and raise a new problem.
And nowadays we have uh, mostly credit money, like more than 90% of money in, in the economy uh, is credit money. And less than 8%, uh, depending on the country, uh, is fiat money. So what is credit money? For you an example, it's easy to understand. Let's say you have a house which worth 10 million US dollar, and you want to do some business. You don't have money, you want to do some business, you have some great idea, let's say after the lecture today, you, uh, you, you have a great DeFi uh, idea, you want to um, make it happen. So you want to hire some developers to build it up and to start your own business. So you have a house and you don't want to sell your house. So what you can do is you can go to a bank. There's a bank, uh, we will check the market value of the, of the house, maybe it's 10 million and the bank could issue you 5 million US dollar. So it's over collateralized, 200% over collateralized. I will explain later why it's over collateralization. So what banks do, um, banks just create 5 million US dollar out of thin air and then create credit this money in your account. Now you, you, now you have 5 million US dollar, you can start your business. One year later, maybe you earn some money, um, then you can pay the principal plus interest to the bank, and the bank gives you your house back. And if you default, if you cannot pay back, the bank will sell your house. So that's credit money. So nowadays, most of the money is uh, credit money. Credit money is digital. It is collateralized by some assets. Okay. And again, credit money brings uh, its own challenge. Uh, it has centralized issuer. I mean, it is issued by some commercial bank. It's satellites. So it lacks of transparency. You don't know what's going on inside. You know, they could like easily print more money. So that's why we need bank supervision. We need someone to supervise these commercial banks so that they don't behave lessly. And we also need a financial networks like ATM machines, bank branch, so you can withdraw money anywhere, and so on and so forth. And also need deposit insurance, you know, the bank might fail. And depositors have their money in this bank. If the bank fails, then you lose all your, all your money. So you, you need some sort of insurance company to insure your deposit. And also, um, now every country has a regulator that requires capital requirements. Meaning, if you open a bank, you attract some money from depositors. And then you might be risky because that's not your money. You can just send money to some risky investors. And if they earn money, you get some, um, some loan interest. If they fail, fine for you, because you're not losing money. It's the depositors who, lo who are losing money. So the capital requirement is, uh, means you, as a banker, need to take some money out of your own pocket and put it in the, bank, uh, the bank's balance sheet. And then since you have your own money in the bank, uh, you have your own skin in the game, then you will be kind of uh, worse you will spend more time on the, on the bank loan uh, and, and so on and so forth, right? So this is um, the problem of credit money, it lies, uh, lacks of transparency, and to build uh, the trust, uh, you need to set up really a, a complica complicated financial network. And this is costly. You don't see it uh, in your daily life, but it's behind, you know? These all the bankers, they earn salary, they get a bonus, they build fancy buildings, and the bank supervisors, insurance company employees, and also financial regulators, they all get a salary, right? Where does the salary come from? It comes from you, it comes from every depositor, it comes from every uh, one in this in this country, because you pay tax, and the tax is used to set up this financial network. So this is an invisible cost. People are not aware of, but it's very costly. Okay, so this is, this is the credit money, and it solves the problem of the fiat money. Fiat money is backed by nothing, of the government's fragile reputation, and credit money is backed by some new assets, so it's slightly better, uh, but still it's centralized, and um, it's costly. All right, so, if we were to design uh, the next generation of money, what kind of features we need? And this is open. I just came up with this, uh, some features. First has veto, 
can be it can be easily transferred from Switzerland to US to China, and secondly, it has to be secure. And most importantly, of course, there should also be some other features we need. But I want to point out it to be decentralized. If you look at fiat money, the uh, the uh, credit money, they are all centralized. If you look at money in essence, money in, is memory, right? And you look at like, go the company money, it's not issued by one single entity, it's issued by the nature, by uh, by the earth or the, the, the universe. Why should we delegate the, the money creation to some corrupted uh, central bankers or commercial bankers, right? Why should we? Can we just cut off these men? I'm tired of paying them uh, so high salary and bonus, and they are so risk seeking, they just play us. And can we build a decentralized monetary system that is trustful? Meaning we don't need to, that, that is trustless. So, so here trustless doesn't mean there's no trust, it means trustful. Okay. You will see this a lot in, in, uh, in the critical sense. This is very important. It has to be something we can trust. like. The nature that we know that no one is behind the nature, no one can um, can manipulate the power of a gold. You cannot uh, grant some fake gold. And also has to be transparent. Can we democrat demo make it more democratic? All right. So as I said before, money in essence is memory. And at the very beginning, we had we had a very good uh, monetary system, which is the brand money. You know, there's no centralized issuer. But the problem with brand money uh, is that it's not scalable. So that's why we uh, shift to the accounting book. And so we have this fiat money and uh, credit money that rely on the accounting book, but they are centralized. Can we make it decentralized? Um, this decentralized accounting book has to satisfy these three conditions. First, it has to be publicly accessible, meaning everyone can access, everyone can check every transaction so that no one is fooling um, anyone else. And secondly, it has to be verifiable. I transfer some money to my friend, everyone can verify that, my friend can verify that, and also has to be transparent so there's no trick behind. And now here comes the problem. If it's a decentralized ledger that is not owned by one single group of, uh, of entities, now, who has the right to record a transaction? And how do we trust this, this person or this bookkeeper? That is a big challenge. Um, until 2008, uh, a genius came up with this idea and he invented the, the, the Bitcoin. Uh, I will explain that later. So I want to talk about um, how to solve this oh, problem. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much, Yui. I just want to catch one question here. So I found in all the students' answers, they talk about money on uh, different kinds, but it's all good things. Like it seems like we think money is good, money is great. Um, but after your talk, uh, I guess the students would find uh, um, you talk about a lot of the money's problems. So I want to ask the students, um, um, can any of you say uh, something about uh, how you view the problem of money right now. So, uh, like Ch Chara, how how this talk changes a bit of your view about money? Do you have any idea? I think that like uh, now I don't see money as a story like uh, before. Now it's more, it looks more that, than a tool than uh, something else. And I just realized that money doesn't have this, the, the same value that we give it in the real life. Cool. Um, and uh, about this question, so now, now Yumi is going to answer this question. Uh, when there is some problem about money, um, when there when we cannot trust the government, the central bank, there has to be a new bookkeeper. Um, do you have any idea about who is going to be the new bookkeeper? Thank you. Uh, uh, 
What? Uh, I think it's gonna be uh, some network system, like more robotical system than to trust to trust now technology than more than humans, actually. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So so now we're going to see uh, the your story. Yeah. So I'm going to review uh, the current thought uh, of uh, how to trust how to build a decentralized ledger, a decentralized money. So money, um, if it's created by one single group, or a single person or single institution, um, then this institution, institution has a lot of power, a lot of financial power. Then if it has undue amount of power, this results in corruption, right? So, who is going to be the bookkeeper? Shall we delegate that to machine? Yes, we can. But who controls the machine? That's the thing uh, we need to answer, right? If it's machine still owned, controlled by the central bank, then we are not improving the situation. It's still controlled by uh, a single group of entity. So machine is for sure. We need to dedicate something to machine because machine is it's, uh, it's better, it's more efficient, it's, uh, it's not so biased like we are. Um, the problem is who is controlling the machine, right? So here is one solution about how to uh, choose the, the bookkeeper. So, you know, beforehand, we had before, we had this centralized ledger, there's a clearing house, this could be the central bank. And now if we want to make a distributed ledger, you know, every institution, institution has a ledger. So here's the answer. Who is a bookkeeper? Everyone is a bookkeeper. Remember the, the brand money I before? Everyone has a ledger in, in your brand. But the thing is, how do we synchronize? Uh, how do we guarantee that we're on the same page? You transfer some money to your friend, I know that, but someone else who is not aware of that, or he thinks, in transfer money to your friend. So in his mind or in his uh, accounting book, you still have the, the money, you didn't transfer it to your friend. So how do we synchronize? How do we ensure that everyone is on the same table? So here we need to set uh, a consensus, like a list of rules everyone agree on, like every country has a constitution. We all need to obey this constitution. If we break the, the law, we get punished and the same. We need to design a monetary system, a consensus that everyone agree with these rules. So since we let everyone to be the, the, the ledger keeper, how do we uh, make sure that everyone is on the same page? So first, we need to uh, ensure randomly. So we randomly select one person or one institution as a bookkeeper. As a bookkeeper, and this bookkeeper records all the transactions for a certain period, let's say for one day. So today, I will select the, the bookkeeper, okay? And then I collect all the transactions all over the world um, for today, and then record them uh, in my bookkeeper, uh, in my accounting book. And then um, I show my account accounting book, this page, to neighbors. I live in Zurich, I show it to someone in, in Luzern, in Geneva, in Hamburg, somewhere nearby. And, you know, my neighbors, my supervisors, they check the authenticity. If they find, okay, I did a good job, I didn't subtouch, I didn't make some fake transactions or whatever it is uh, that is um, malicious, then what they will do, they will copy it they copy what I recorded and then show it to their neighbors. So also false. So then the accounting book is copied by all peers all over the world, and we are all on the same page. And if someone doesn't copy um, the accounting book, then he's different from all other people, then all other people just don't uh, um, agree with his um, uh, transactions, his accounting book. So in the, uh, in the blockchain system, we have this 
50%, the majority wins. So if the, more than 50% of the people agree on one accounting book, then that's the final accounting book. Okay? And then the second day starts, a new paper is selected, and then the new bookkeeper repeats about procedures. So this is how um, does blockchain work at a high level. And if you replace, uh, if you replace the institution or person by machine, that's Bitcoin, that's blockchain. That's what we're talking today. Wait a bit, problem with my video. All right, cool. So then we come to the second part, blockchain. So as I mentioned, blockchain is a, a ledger, a distributed ledger. And the second uh, feature of blockchain is a smart contract is also possible. So that's the second part of this, uh, of this section two. So uh, we talk about, about blockchain. Let's uh, now think about how to choose a bookkeeper on the blockchain. So on the blockchain, in the crypto space, bookkeeper is also called a miner in the Bitcoin system and also some other crypto project, they call it validators. So in essence, it's the same, it's just a bookkeeper. So how do we choose a bookkeeper? We randomly select someone, right? But how do you guarantee uh, the randomness, right? If it's not truly random and I could manipulate the randomness, then I could, you know, subtitle, I could choose who is going to be the next bookkeeper and then we could collude. So, this selection of paper has to be uh, neutral, has to be really random. And what do we do? The first generation of blockchain project, they use proof of work. So in other words, it means the system generates a cryptographic rhythm. And anyone or any computer who solves the crypto cryptographic rhythm first has the right to recall transactions for a certain period. So the bookkeeper is selected by uh, the system. So the system gets a riddle and then it's fair to everyone. Whoever solves the riddle first becomes the, uh, the bookkeeper. And so this is about a bookkeeper about the DOS attack. You know, this is a typical uh, attack in the network, um, in the internet network. DOS means deny of service. You know, let's say we now, how many people we are, let's say, uh, uh, many people we have, like more than 40. Um, we want to use, uh, um, you know, everyone wants to ask questions now. And someone, let's say, who you all want to subtype, who you all send 1,000 spammy messages asking irrelevant questions. And then no one could ask questions because we all send uh, too, too much uh, spamming uh, information. So how to prevent the DOS attack, um, we leave it to economic, we charge them. If you send um, a transaction, they need to pay some transaction fee. And in the crypto space, it's called gas fee. Meaning if I transfer money to Luyo, I need to pay some transaction fee. If I send 1,000 messages, then I need to pay a lot. So that's costly for me. And there's, this is, I don't have incentive to do that. Uh, you might think the transaction fee might be too high compared to the, to the transfer if you use a bank system. I can tell you, if you transfer 10 bucks or 100 bucks uh, to your friend, it's, it's comparable. But if you transfer like more than 100,000 or one, 1 million, it's much cheaper than uh, using a banking service. And if you transfer like 1 billion from Switzerland to US, First of all, it, it takes a lot uh, of effort because you need to make the KYC and AML, the anti-money laundering, and know your customer. And the bank's going to charge you some quite some fee and also exchange fee. Um, and then it might cost you hundreds of thousands if you transfer one billion. But if you use the PM, they cost you less than one dollar. It's much cheaper, right? Okay, and the next question is, uh, what is the incentive for owners? You know, okay, why would I recall transactions? Why would I do that? Two reasons. First, 
they get a block reward. So each block, you know, each block is like a, a comic book a page. Now on this page, you record all the transactions, right? And then if you record uh, one page, you will get some uh, reward in Bitcoin or in Ethereum or in some other tokens. Uh, this is how money is generated in the crypto space. And second, you will earn some transaction fees paid by the users. So that's the incentive for miners. And think about this is, uh, let's say you are selected as a bookkeeper. So now you collect all the transactions from network and recall the transaction in this block. So this is, I, this is a hash key that matter. Uh, you, you recall all the transactions uh, in this block. Think about this is like a one page of the accounting book. You recall now uh, Jack transfers 1,000 US dollar to Lucy. Lucy transfers uh, 10,000 to, to Dom and so on and so forth. And after finishing this block, you will receive all the transactions fees paid by all these uh, users and also some block rewards uh, minted by, this, uh, by, the, by the network. So you will have a wallet somewhere here and all the money, all the transaction fees and block rewards will flow uh, to your wallet automatically. Okay? And then uh, in the next period, another keeper is randomly selected. So he or she collects all the transactions in the network and records all the transactions and also connect this block to the previous block. And so on and so forth, you will have a chain. So this is how blockchain comes from. This is a block of a chain of block. That's uh, that's where the word comes from. All right. So this is blockchain, uh, and this is the features of the of the chain. You know, it's a it's a ledger. It's a distributed ledger. You can see some uh, abbreviation like DLT. That means uh, distributed ledger technology. So first of all, now it's decentralized, and it's not managed by one person or one institution. It is managed by a network of nodes, like of machines, and it's people behind these machines. So it's fully decentralized. And secondly, it's transparent. All the transactions are recorded on the blockchain. Everyone can check that, everyone can verify that. Uh, no one can, uh, can make some fake transactions. And third, it's immutable. You know, if you transfer some money to your friend, it's executed and no one can revert this transaction. Um, then you can be uh, ensured that your money is uh, truly uh, transferred to your friend. And uh, it's also secure, right? Because now if you will destroy one node or several nodes, the whole system still works. So it avoids a single uh, point failure. Right? The, the network is, is more resilient than a single network, a single node network. All right. I, so I think the what, what you just uh, said uh, matters a lot to our students here because uh, half of our students are international students. So I just want to ask uh, our international students here, do you know how much uh, percentage of the transaction fees you have to pay? Will you transfer your local currency to RMB for your tuition? Anyone know about that? Any, any of our international students here? No? <laughs> so you never ask your parents how, how much you have to pay for the transaction fee? How about, uh, yeah, who is um, I, I actually know the, the transaction fee because this one time I was taking so much money out that my parents had to tell me, do you know how much money you're taking out every time you're um, taking some money? So that's how I found out. Okay, how much is it? Um, in South Africa, it's around, I think it was 59 rands, but I'm not sure. Um, it was 59 to 70, I'm not sure anymore. Uh, so it's 59 to 70 RMB for each transaction? No, uh, actually it's, I have, I only have it in the currency here yep. in Rand. 
So <laughs> I'm not really sure what it is in RMBs. Okay, but it sounds like a lot, like your parents complain. Uh, yeah, they did complain a lot. Yeah, so, so if one day because of this blockchain and uh, this decentralized ledger technology, you don't need to pay the transaction fee, then it all becomes your money to spend. Yeah. That is, sounds great. Okay, yeah, so, yeah. How, so all of you should contribute to this technology transformation so you can get the money uh, from the bank to yourself and you can hang out with friends for every entertainment or like books for uh, human capital investment. That's cool. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so let, let me remind you, this phase are visible, you can see that every time you exchange your uh, the currency from your from your native country to China or some other uh, sovereign currencies, you can see the exchange rate, the exchange fee, the commission fee, and also banks might charge you some fee. These are visible fees, but they also visible fees like the the banker's salary are paid by you, right? And also the financial regulators, the government employees, all of them are paid by you by your tax. And this is the invisible part, and this is actually the bigger part. All right, so um, I mentioned before, the first uh, generation of blockchain projects um, are like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dogcoin, they're different um, blockchain projects, the first generation. And what they do uh, is basically just a distributed ledger so that they record all the transactions in each block. And over time, we realized that we can do more than that. We can do more than a decentralized money. Uh, you might wonder where's the money come from. Um, so you know, in each block, you know, if I uh, was selected as the block maker, as the or bookkeeper of this block, um, I will receive uh, initially like fifty bitcoin and also some transaction fees in my wallet. So this is how money is generated. It's like how gold is minted, uh, how gold is uh, is mined. Um, I, I go to like the west part of the US like hundreds of years ago and find some gold and that's how I got the gold as commodity money and then spend the gold to, in, to other people in the society. That's how money circulates in the economy. And in the Bitcoin, the, every block generates some Bitcoin and that's how money is created. You see now the Bitcoin or the new money is, create, is created in a decentralized way. Okay, so that's the first generation of uh, blockchain projects. Most of them uh, are just uh, a distributed ledger. That's nothing fancy, interesting, but it opens a new door. So over time, uh, Bitcoin was uh, created in, uh, the, the, the white paper was written into some bits by uh, Nakamoto Satoshi and uh, was realized, implemented into some nine. And over time, there are many different kind of cryptocurrency projects developed and due to 2015, a new blockchain project uh, emerged called Ethereum. Uh, we call this the second generation blockchain project. Uh, it differs from the first generation in the sense that uh, on Ethereum, you could, you could, um, you could, you could transact, you could um, generate uh, or record transactions and uh, create smart contracts. So it adds like a second layer in each block. So it's not just transactions, but also smart contracts. And what is smart contract? Smart contracts uh, are just like some programming uh, logics. Uh, I come to this later in the next few slides. Okay, so we are now uh, in the uh, era of Ethereum, the second generation of blockchain. And there are like now uh, like like at least uh, like a dozen of Bitcoin not Bitcoin blockchain projects. They are building the third generation uh, blockchain project. But now we are still in the second generation. Okay. Uh, yeah. By the way, Definity is a third generation, so we are making the future. <laughs> All right. So what is smart contract? Let's first talk about uh, the stupid contract. The traditional contract we have nowadays. Um, one typical example is, let's say you have some government bonds 
um, I, I want to buy a government bond. So we can sign an account. I say, I give $1,000 and you give me 100 government bonds. We sign this agreement. I transfer money from my bank account to your bank account. And then you have to give me the 100 government bonds. If, if not, um, I could sue you, right? And the police will uh, catch you and uh, you might be put in uh, prison, a fine, or the, the court will force you to transfer the gun bonds to me. So we signed the contract. What is a contract? It's just a paper. It's, a, uh, it's, it's a not binding if there's no such a trust in this. Uh, you could renege, you take my money and just run away, abscond with my money. And I transfer money to you because I believe someone will help me to enforce this contract if you don't transfer me the government bonds. So again, like the contract is like the paper money, the fiat money, it has no binding, uh, uh, it, it's, it's not effective there if there's no uh, third party. Right? So um, as I said before, if the third party is involved, there's a middleman, then it's costly. Uh, it's invisible, but it's costly. So what smart contracts do um, is to replace, eliminate the third party. So I'll give you an example how it works. Let's say now uh, I'll exchange my token A for, uh, for your token B. And we agree on this exchange rate. One token A equals what, 10 token B. So what I can do, uh, or what you can do, is write a smart contract, which are just some programming codes. And this smart contract states, if 100 token A are received, um, please transfer 1,000 token B to the sender. Okay, so after writing um, such a, a smart contract, you could transfer your 1,000 token B from your wallet to this smart contract. Okay. And then this one sum token B uh, stay in smart contract. If I send 100 token A, this one sum token B will be sent to my account automatically. And this 100 token A will be credited to your account also automatically. So this smart contract actually acts, acts as a, a third party, a trustful uh, third party because it's machine, it's, uh, it's computer code and executes the program automatically. If A is satisfied, then B is executed. And this smart contract is publicly, publicly verified. Everyone can go and check the smart contract. Everyone can trace the flow of the token and it's transparent. Once it's executed, it's immutable. No one can change it anymore. So we sign a smart contract, we, we don't need all these entities. And this uh, doesn't mean that uh, we don't need lawyers, we don't need police, they still need to do something else that smart contracts can, cannot do. So smart contracts just help uh, lawyers to alleviate their uh, tech technicality, some trivial work, right? All right, so here I give you an example uh, of the smart contract. So this is uh, on Ethereum, the second generation of smart uh, of, of blockchain project. And they use uh, a program language called Solidity which is pretty dumb. Uh, that's why we, we are, uh, definitely we have a new language called Motoko, uh, much smarter for, uh, for smart contract writing. So I just have, show you an example. See a smart contract is pretty simple. Just write some codes. Everyone can learn that like within one or two days, you can write something here. And uh, what smart contract will do is first install business rules. Like if A then B, in this contract, and then it verifies rules. So if you send 100 token A, it verifies, okay, I received 100 token A, and then we'll execute automatically without intervention of any third party. So I uh, see with smart contract, it's secure, it's low cost because it's a machine, and it's instant. Um, you send token A, you receive token B uh, instantly. And it's 24 seven accessible, you don't need to worry. Uh, that is not working in, in the weekends like banks. And also it's transparent. You write these codes on the internet, everyone can see that. So everyone can check whether there's a backdoor or whether this code are well written or not. Well, you might 
um, you might worry that what if I can't read these codes, right? So they're also like these codes can be audited. You can uh, you can use some auditing some experts to audit your code, and then they could say your your codes are secure. Okay, and that also is immutable. So you don't need to worry that you send token A and then uh, receive token B and later on they steal your token B. That's that's not possible. All right, so that's smart contract. I give you some use case. Um, say you have a great idea. You uh, open your own business. You have a startup. You get some venture capitalists to finance your projects. You get uh, some employees to work it out, and then you have a product. So you want to uh, get more money uh, so that you could uh, deploy more firms abroad. So you can do IPO, which is public offering, um, but that you need the help of the investment bank and lawyers, and uh, that's costly, right? So here I want to show you that with smart contract, with blockchain technology, everyone can do IPO on the blockchain within 10 minutes uh, at, at almost zero cost. So on the blockchain, it's called initial coin offering, ICO. You might have heard a lot of these ICO scandals, um, but nowadays it's, it's better regulated and people are learned. So that happened in almost every new thing that has uh, been invented. All right, so you write an ICO smart contract. In this smart contract, you write one Bitcoin equals 100 ABC coins. So say you uh, create some ABC coins, and these ABC coins um, can be used in your smart country, in your business. So the ABC is like ABC coin, it's like your, uh, your shares or stocks of your company, okay? Then you set the exchange rate, one Bitcoin equals 100 ABC. All right, and then some investors find that your project is really interesting, they, they think it's promising, um, so they want to invest in your company. So what they can do, they can send their money, their Bitcoin or some stable coin or any coin um, as long as you accept these coins. They could send coins to Bitcoin to your smart contract. And of course they need first to check your smart contract. Um, if they trust your smart contract, they send Bitcoin and then they receive ABC coin instantly, automatically. Okay. And then in this smart contract uh, accumulates a lot of Bitcoin. Now at the end of the, of the ICO stage, you will receive all the Bitcoin in your own wallet. And then you can sell this Bitcoin in some exchange and get some US dollar and then use this money to, um, to expand your business. So this is how you could raise fund um, uh, Bitcoin. You see here, no lawyer uh, involved, no banker involved, um, free of charge, right? And the second use case of smart contract is uh, you can build a bank on, uh, on blockchain. And now, if you want to bank in real life, uh, there are many hurdles. It's also very costly. You need to fulfill a lot of requirements and you also need to deposit a lot of money as a capital. So uh, it's, it's very hard. But on Ethereum, I can show you that within 10 minutes, you can open a bank, right? Uh, I'm not going to dive in detail here because uh, I realize some of you, some team is going to present compounds. So to be fair, I'm, I'm going to talk too much about this. I leave this to, to that team. So um, this compound is, is basically like a bank uh, on the blockchain. So it was deployed by a team, I think with less than 10 people at the very beginning and now slowly uh, grew to, I think still less than 50. So it's not a team. And they built a bank in uh, in summer 2000 last year, and just like less than one year, uh, the the market value uh, or the, the, the money uh, stored in the bank grew from near zero to now around one and a half billion US dollar within one year, uh, with around ten team members. Right, that's amazing, right? So oh, that will never happen in real life. That will take you ages to build such a, a bank with such a, a market cap. And uh, so maybe talk still a little bit here. 
say you can you can uh, deposit so different seems, tokens. Seems we can have four, at least four banks in one year. <laughs> yeah. Um, so watch out now. Uh, so this banking industry on the blockchain is kind of competitive. If you want to open a bank, you have to be different from other banks. So uh, pay attention to that. And also I encourage you to have out of box thinking. Everyone's doing bank, why don't I do something else that is brandly new, right? All right, so, uh, so in this bank, you could deposit different currencies. Um, Ether, USDC, that's a stable coin. Day is also a stable coin. And, and borrowers could also borrow money, borrow day or USDC, and so on and so forth. Okay, so I'm going to skip this part. Um, so yeah, so that's blockchain and contract. And I'll also show you two use cases of smart contract. Um, and then we come to this decentralized finance. So the smart bank and ICO, that is actually, uh, that belongs to decentralized finance. Okay, so what is decentralized finance? Uh, before you, uh, you tell us yes, what is yes. decentralized finance. Yeah. Let, let, yeah. let me ask the students, uh, what is finance? Can anyone answer the question? What, what do you think is finance? How about um, uh, Yi Tong, Huang Yi Tong? Uh, Shirley? Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, yeah. I think um, I don't know the, the, the clear definition of that, but I think it's just a subsector of the economy, I think. Can you uh, give us an example in reality? Like what is finance? Like what uh, do with it? It's mm, more relative to the, relevant to the sound, uh, the, the, the functions of the bank and uh, other, uh, I don't know how to <laughs> state this clearly. Yeah, I, I got you. You you said like uh, it's related to the functionings of bank. Yeah, I, I just know a little about this. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So some of you had answered your question in the survey. You know what's the difference between open finance and decentralized finance? Uh, do any of you wanna wanna say something about that? Maybe Ding Ya Qi. Uh, Stella? Uh, yes, teacher. Yes. Uh, can you say anything about uh, the open finance, decentralized finance, or what do you think finance is? Well, I think finance is that um, it's maybe about uh, how to use the uh, money. Um, it's like, um, oh, sorry, I don't know how to explain my idea. Okay, sounds cool. So now Yui is going to give us an answer. Right. <clears throat> so, um, you know, now we have mostly the traditional finance. Um, you know, finance is really a big, broad project. So to be fair, if you ask me what is finance, it's also very hard to answer. So what I can talk about is the, the current uh, financial system is uh, it's closed. Uh, meaning like all the banks, their own information and they make decisions uh, in a closed group. And if you want to use their service, you need to first apply. And so that is in contrast to the decentralized finance, which is open. You deploy some smart contract or like a smart bank on the a blockchain that everyone can use that no matter where you're from you can just use that 24 7 it's permissionless anyone can use that you don't need a permission uh, from this uh, the, the the founder of this uh, of this application and also it's trustless you don't like nowadays if you open a bank account i guess like in most developing developed countries you don't need to worry about the bank rent but in some developing countries bank rent is still a problem the bank might fail so 
before you deposit your your, your money in some bank, you, you need to do some research whether this bank is uh, robust, is solid uh, or not, right? You because you worry about whether your money uh, you can still get your money in a couple of years. And decentralized finance is open, permissionless, and trustless compared to the current traditional closed finance. All right, so um, I could uh, give some, uh, I could contrast the open finance to a, a closed financial system uh, by showing you some features of the, of the open finance or decentralized finance. Let's call it DeFi. Okay, so the DeFi uh, is not created um, from scratch. It's more about to make the current closed financial system uh, more democratic, right? And there are many um, banks like uh, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and also like Facebook, these tech giants, they have this project called Libra. They are embracing the, the new challenges, the new technology, the decentralized distrib dis uh, distributed ledger technology. So the differences are first, uh, the decentralized finance uh, uh, doesn't have a middleman or third party. So it means it saves a lot of, of fees for users. You don't need middlemen, you don't need to pay salary or fees to all these middlemen. And secondly, also most importantly is you are holding your own assets. You could now download some crypto wallet in your, uh, in your mobile phone, okay? And get some crypto assets in your, mo in your uh, crypto wallet. And this money is uh, truly owned by you, not by the wallet uh, creator, uh, not by anyone else. Okay? That is different from your bank deposit. You show me that you have some money in your pay account, in your WeChat account, but we all know that money is not in your hand. It's, uh, it's in WeChat, in, in Tencent's uh, hand or uh, Ali's hand. Uh, what is on your phone is just some number, some digital number that can change the number anytime, any day, right? And with crypto, it's truly on your crypto wallet, crypto uh, account. You have lost your phone, don't worry, as long as you hold your private key, that is like the password. You can restore all your money in another computer or another mobile phone at any time. And money truly is in your own hand. And also while you use a smart bank, you are not giving your money to the bank. It's still in your wallet, right? That's a major difference between the DeFi and the traditional finance. And also some other features uh, might be less important, like it's 24 seven accessible, you can use in the midnight, like other week, I want to transfer some money to my friend, you can do that right away. And here in Switzerland, if I want to transfer some money to my friend in the US, if it's a weekend, I have to wait until Monday. And if it's a lot of money, the bank will uh, postpone and then ask me and call me and to check whether I really want to transfer them to my friend. So that takes several days and also costly. Right? And other features like it's open source, it's transparency, uh, it has transparency, it's also permissionless. Okay, so here I want to give you an example. Um, I have like 10 minutes left. Well, how many minutes I have? Uh, yes. Okay, sure. So uh, here I'll give you an example of, um, of a DeFi, a major use case now um, um, is, is um, again, come back to this uh, example I gave before. You have some uh, house or you have some crypto assets and you want some business, but you don't want to sell your crypto assets. So what you can do, you can go to a smart bank on the, on the blockchain and then say, look, I want to pledge my crypto asset like Bitcoin, Ethereum, all these coins, stable coins as collateral, and then borrow some money from you. So then this smart contract or this smart bank could generate automatically some stable coins. Uh, these stable coins, uh, so stable coin is some uh, digital currency that is pegged to the US dollar or some other sovereign currency. So one stable coin equals exactly one US dollar. Okay. So you, let's say you have 10 million US dollar Bitcoin, uh, you place them as a collateral, then you get 5 million US dollar uh, in stable coin. And then you can use this stable coin, this 5 million to do your business, right? And why do we need over collateralization? Right? Why I deposit 
one 10 million and I get only five million. The reason is because um, the crypto asset, the price is very volatile. Today is 10 million, maybe tomorrow it becomes seven million, right? And it also drops to one million. The price drops to uh, one million. Remember, you borrowed five million from this from this crypto bank. So now you need to pay back five million to get 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 back your one million collateral. Would you do that? Probably you will not, right? Probably just abandon your your collateral and then keep this five million. So for this bank, smart bank to run the collateral, the value of the collateral has to be more than the value of the loan uh, uh, you, you get from the bank. So that's why we need over collateralization. Okay, so here I give you a flow chart how to get money, uh, how to get a bank loan, and how to get your collateral back. Let's say now you have some ether in your wallet, you send it to, um, to, um, to a smart contract. And this smart contract is called a collateralized data position, CDP. Uh, meaning the debt is collateralized, okay? So you send some ESA, and then this smart contract um, generates some DAI token, uh, which is a stable coin, to your account. And don't worry, this ESA still stays in your own wallet. It's just frozen. You cannot move it, and no move it. So you don't need to worry that the CDP creator could just steal your money. Don't worry, money is still in your wallet. So your money, your ESA is is uh, locked or frozen. And uh, as a compensation, you get some day token as like a bank loan. Okay, you deposit, you, your 10 million ESA is frozen and you get five million day token. And then the day token you can spend, uh, you can just transfer this money to do your business. And some day later, let's say one year later, you earn some money and you want to get back your ESA. So what you can do is, you pay this five million day token back to the smart contract. And this is five, maybe plus some interest, right? Maybe the interest is 1%, you pay five million plus 50,000 uh, day token back to the CD, to the contract. Okay, that five million of the day token will be burned, will be destroyed. Why? Because this five million day token generated or created out of thin air in the first place. So when they are returned, they're also burned. This is to ensure that every day token in circulation is backed by some ether in uh, uh, some frozen ether in, in uh, some collateral in the user's account. Right? Remember the, the credit money? All the money created out of thin air, they have some collateral backed the, the value, endorsed the value of the, of the bank loans. Okay, so you pay back the principal and interest to a smart contract and the smart contract and freeze your collateral. And now you can use your ether again. So this is how it works um, in, uh, in the CDP smart contract. Um, here is uh, also like a numeric example. Let's say, we still have some time here. So you, you have some ether in your wallet, okay? You go to a CDP, you say, I send one ether to CDP, but actually this ether, it's a, it's a token. It's still in your wallet. It's just frozen, okay? And then this ESA generates uh, 66 to your account. So now you have one ESA in your wallet, frozen, and 66 day token. And then you can spend the day token, whatever you want to do with that token. And some day later, you want to redeem your ESA. So what you need to do is to stand back the 66 day to the CDP. And then these days uh, are destroyed. And then your ESA, is unfreezed, then you, you can release it again. Okay. So this is how it works. And remember there's always a problem um, with, with the new technology, right? So I think I'm going to skip this because uh, some team is going to present liquidity. And so I leave this to the liquidity team. So liquidity is a project developed by a friend of mine. Um, it's a mechanism mechanism is pretty similar to this one. Uh, but this one has some problems, so liquidity try to solve uh, some of this problem. But of course, it has some other problem. I leave this to, uh, I forget which team, to that team, all right. All right, so the last section, what is uh, the future trends of the blockchain? Here, I show you some uh, decentralized applications, we call them DApps. 
that's in contrast to the applications we have now. Uh, nowadays, applications on your mobile phone, Android or iOS system, they are all centralized. They are all owned by the, uh, the, 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 the companies. Right? And these decentralized, decentralized apps um, are created by some teams, and then they are totally decentralized. And they are owned by users. But of course, some projects are still sort of centralized. But that's because we are transitioning from this centralized system to decentralized system. And in turn, we have sort of a uh, mix. Right? And there are different categories of the uh, DOPS. Um, first category is uh, asset management. Uh, this is mostly like some crypto uh, wallet. So you can download this wallet in your mobile, on, on your browser, using your computer, and then you can uh, send your crypto asset to this wallet, and this crypto asset stay in your wallet. Okay? And the second category is the prediction market, for instance, Augur. Uh, is uh, one of the major uh, DApps. So, for instance, you could bet who is going to be, whether Donald Trump is going to win the presidential uh, election in the fall um, this year or not. And, uh, you know, there could be people say yes, people no, and then you can, um, you can, you can send some money there. And if you lose, you lose money. If you win, uh, you, you earn money from the opponents. So this is uh, the prediction market you know, some KYC know your customer identity. Someone is going, some team is going to present uh, Civic. So I leave this to that team. And marketplaces, this is where you can trade your crypto assets, like CryptoKitty um, or some other tokens. And this is a payment DApp. You can use, uh, you can buy some um, stuff by um, using these DApps can pay in Bitcoin or in Ethereum. And lending facility, uh, asset tokenization, margin trading, someone is going to prevent, some team is going to present the DYDA. And derivatives, I think one team is going to present the synthetics. And exchanges, decentralized exchanges, uh, Uniswap, uh, I think one team is going to present Bangkok, this one. And staking, insurance, one team is going to print access mutual and stable coins. Um, I just explained to you the McDoll, where is it? Anyway, so uh, the stable coin infrastructure um, is actually some of these apps in these categories. All right, so that's, uh, that's the future trend. There are numerous, um, there are numerous applications and they're also like now thousands of uh, decentralized application team, they are building uh, their own DApps on different blockchain projects. So I encourage you to develop your own DApp and deploy them on this decentralized network and start to earn money. All right, so thank you, thanks to everyone. Um, one thing I need to point out is this is decentralized, it's, it's a blockchain, uh, and uh, it might come out of some idea maybe very fancy idea, but also think out of the box. Um, like how would you connect your decentralized application to reality? How does your DR uh, help people in real life? That's very important. Remember the, the second message I want to give you at the beginning? Technology prospers if they meet the real demand of people. Alright, so that's it.